Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so one of the great things about being a research director is that from time to time, uh, one gets to commission some research. Uh, and the research project that we're going to talk about today uh, did two uh, separate uh, but related um, functions. Uh, one was to create an analytical framework through which we can distribute the content of these long-term plans. And the second element was to see whether or not we could manage to analyze the capital markets consequences uh, of these long-term plans. Now, we did this um, for several reasons. As you'll have seen in your packs, you have the uh, investor letter that we is the sort of primary basis for our briefing to the uh, companies that present at these uh, CEO investor forums. What we wanted to see is how are the companies doing in relation to responding to those thematic prompts, you know, the seven questions every CEO should be able to answer. Can we see where they're struggling, where they're doing well, and then where, where there are areas where there is not sufficient disclosure? Can we then respond with briefing to Im improve um, those areas? Uh, secondly, you know, we're all aware that investor relations and disclosure activity um, has capital markets consequences. You know, uh, uh, our capital markets respond to information such as earnings releases. Where on that continuum of capital markets impact is the long-term plan? Is it disclosing information that the market does not have? Is it disclosing information that the market feels to be valuable? Um, thirdly is an element to try to meet the markets where they are. Well, you know, we know uh, short-termism um, is a problem. We think that these long-term plans have long-term kind of signaling and investor segmentation benefits uh, for CEOs. But can we also tell them a story that says, if you come and deliver a long-term plan, actually investors in the short term respond to that information? Uh, we think that would be a very significant proof of concept um, for us. Um, and just stepping back, as, as Daryl has said and many people have said, we want uh, CEOs, every CEO of a listed company, to, de to deliver a long-term plan. Um, so let's marshal some arguments um, to help them do that. And we think that this is a lot less about reducing reporting frequency, as some people have sort of a a alluded to. And it's a lot more about reorienting the mix of information that companies disclose uh, to the market. Um, so this project um, was also featured, um, uh, self-promotion alert, uh, in Harvard Business Review this morning, co-authored uh, with Professor Seraphim and uh, Christina from uh, KKS Advisors. So that was the sort of broad uh, idea for the project. That's where we uh, started out. So who to commission to help us with it? Um, so firstly, uh, KKS uh, Advisors. I've been reading KKS Advisors' work since there has been a KKS Advisors. Uh, they produce some really terrific uh, work. Uh, I'd highlight their work on integrated guidance and moving away from uh, quarterly earnings guidance. I think that's work, along with the work that FCLT has done in this space, that has had real-world impact. You may have seen the National Investor Relations Institute recently said they disfavor quarterly earnings guidance, which is no small thing. And I think the work of KKS and FCLT in that space has actually been really significant. They've also done a, a range of aligned work on uh, corporate governance and sustainability and work on corporate purpose, so really clearly aligned um, with our work. Uh, I wanted to highlight uh, that a lot of the heavy lifting has been done by uh, Christina and Sakis. George and I are just the glamorous interns. Uh, if uh, Sakis and Christina could stand up so people can see who you are. Uh, we, we actually started this project really relatively early on this summer. So let's say when some of you may have been on the beach, uh, Sakis and Christina were reading long-term plan transcripts. Um, so it's been, it's been a busy but productive summer. Um, and that then brings me to uh, George. Now, for me, the best way to talk about George is to talk about his seminal academic papers. If you look on SSRN, George has around about 80 uh, scholarly papers, which is just showing off, frankly. Um, I personally, in my journey in sustainability, have found those papers to convey like clear-eyed, very practical intellectual architecture for thinking through sustainability and why it matters. You know, work like uh, how ESG investors, how investors use ESG information, critical difference. Um, uh, e uh, indexes as stewards of the commons, corporate sustainability, um, and uh, operational process. I found those incredibly useful and, and practical um, in my daily work. Not a surprise uh, that George uh, has been identified as a 
uh, top 10 most influential uh, uh, person in um, sustainability in the US. And I would just briefly say um, that also George is involved in his own long-term project at the business school, um, which is that he teaches a course called Reimagining Capitalism. That class has gone from being a sort of somewhat esoteric, somewhat marginal part of the Harvard Business School curriculum. Actually, we have an alumni there. Um, and uh, it's now the most oversubscribed course at the business school. So uh, if there was a bellwether or some sort of barometer, perhaps, of change being afoot about the way we think about firms and corporate purpose, that might be quite a good one. So with great pleasure, Professor Serafine. All right. Thank you very much, Brian. And thank you very much, Daryl and Mark, for actually showing leadership, creating a new institution society, and moving the conversation forward. It's, it's very much appreciated, not by everybody in this room, but I think everybody outside of this room as well. Um, so I will try, while you're eating and I'm hungry, to give you a sense of the research that we have done. Um, OK. So as Brian mentioned, many, many people have contributed to this research uh, over the summer, uh, minimizing beach time uh, and maximizing work time, uh, including uh, Christina and Sakis and Brona and, of course, Mark and Brian. Um, so this is uh, the fruit of labor of many, many people. Uh, why this project is important? One of the reasons is because there is a lot of discussion about curbing short-term disclosures. Um, you heard, for example, earlier today around quarterly reporting, a lot of work that is being done about guidance, which, um, as it was mentioned before, it's quite different. We shouldn't confuse the two concepts. Uh, and there is a lot of uh, great work that has been done, for example, by FCLT and by KKS on the guidance side. But equally important, it is, it is very important to recognize that if you actually don't increase long-term information, then you're unlikely to reorient the attention of management towards long-term management. So the platform here is about creating that long-term information infrastructure in society. And this becomes very important. But of course, when you say that, then lots of people will say, well, so what? So we are 200 people in here. Why are we here? Is anything happening? Is anything changing? In some sense, you can think about this as the impact assessment of CECP a little bit. What is their impact? What are they doing? And I have to say, it's pretty actually adventurous and courageous of them to do an impact assessment of themselves a little bit. So you can think about what we're doing here as understanding what the, whether this is worth your time and being here. And of course, whether this is the worth of all the CEOs that are coming and presenting those long-term plans. Is anything changing here? So we'll try to address that question. So we embarked on understanding two things. The first one, what is a good long-term plan? We did content analysis and we created a framework <coughs> using the great work that many organizations have done. This wasn't purely created by us. We drew from many organizations to say, what is a long-term plan? What those long-term plans actually include? The second piece is understanding market reactions within short event windows. That's what we do in research. That's what we do as infrastructure to understand whether announcements have some type of information content, whether anybody cares. So we are looking at price reactions. We are looking at volume reactions, trading volume reactions. We are looking at an analyst forecast issuances following those long-term plans. And perhaps most importantly, what we do is we try to correlate the quality of the long-term plans with the magnitude of the reaction to try and say, is it the case, at least in the very limited evidence that, that we have, that there is some correlation between the quality of the long-term plans and the magnitude of the reactions? Okay? And of course, the first time that Brian contacted me and said, we should do some analysis, and I say, OK, how many data points you have? And he's like, 19. <laughs> I was like, 
interesting. <laughs> we did it. Let's see. Um, so as I said, what is the long-term plan? We drew from uh, excellent work that is already being done. A lot of the work that CECB has already done in terms of uh, the letter to the CEOs and what questions to ask and so forth. Great work that has been done by F FCLT and Ariel is there. If you want more information about FCLT work, she can update you about the great work that they're doing. Great work by McKinsey and KGS and so forth. And of course, importantly, we also got investor feedback um, that has been given on those forums. So one of the things that both Mark and Brian told me probably 10 times to say to you is give feedback, okay, <laughs> after this event. Because actually, this is informative and it affects uh, what type of information is being presented. And we identified nine themes. So as we were trying to create a framework, we tried to bring together elements and create a framework that kind of makes sense. So going from financial performance and capital allocation and trends to competitive positioning, risks and opportunities, and corporate governance, to purpose, human capital, and long-term value creation through ecosystem structuring. And those nine categories uh, break down to try and assess what is actually in them in 22 issues, so within the nine themes. So when you're thinking about financial performance, you're thinking about capital efficiency and profitability. We heard great comments and great questions around capital, how are you using kind of uh, the efficiency of your capital, the revenue growth, leverage, and so forth. When you're thinking about capital allocation, how is that capital allocated? Should that be used for M&A, for R&D? Should that be returned to shareholders, and so forth? Trends, we heard a great presentation by Energy Energy in terms of uh, digitization and so forth. So what are the market trends and megatrends? What is the competitive positioning? Long-term value creation, medium-term value creation, short-term value creation, what are the drivers? Risks and opportunities, how are you managing emerging risks but also opportunities from ESG issues but also um, outside ESG issues? Corporate governance, what is the role of executive compensation? Again, we heard some of that uh, today as well. Board composition, something extremely important to me that was said this morning was how boards are actually trying to find capabilities to fit their emerging customer needs, right? So uh, some of that information, a lot about corporate purpose. What is the purpose and how importantly it is aligned with long-term strategy? Human capital, how is this human capital being managed? If you are trying to become a digitized provider, if you are trying to compete on the basis of technology, how are you going to attract the human capital to allow you to provide solutions for that? I don't think anybody 22 year old graduating from MIT in engineering is dreaming about working in energy energy to begin with. Probably they're thinking about Facebook and Google, right? So as you're building your business, how do you, you attract those people? Uh, Long-term value creation, how do you build uh, strategic partnerships? We heard a little bit from uh, GSK around strategic partnerships and so forth. So this is our framework, this is our content framework uh, when we're creating this analysis. And then, of course, we, we had to create a disclosure scoring theme. So we borrowed from the great work uh, that the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board has been doing in terms of scoring disclosures on their own material issues. So we created this, we, we modified it a little bit, and we created this four-point um, framework in terms of there is no disclosure about a specific issue, or there is boilerplate, some generic disclosure. Somebody mentions around corporate purpose and some general statements, but there is nothing specific. Um, and then we created uh, a category around uh, that there is specificity, but it's mostly backward looking. And the fourth one, that there's specificity and the metrics are forward looking. And here is uh, a summary of the results that we found. Again, take a lot of what we're saying here as the first building blocks of understanding and building an infrastructure of what this platform is actually achieving. The, the data is still very limited, only 19 observations, but we want to create this infrastructure so moving forward we can have 100 observations and 1,000 observations, and we have created a new institution society that then we can 
actually study and understand the consequences and how we are refocusing capital markets. So the first finding is that we do find some evidence, to my surprise, to be honest with you. I didn't expect it. We do find some evidence of abnormal market reactions, primarily around trading volume. Some evidence as well in terms of prices, but primarily at, around trading volume. The second thing that we find is a no finding. Basically, we find that no abnormal activity in terms of new forecasts from sell side analysts within a window. So it seems that there is investor activity, but sell side analysts, for whatever is pre being presented here, it doesn't seem that it's relevant in terms of like how they make forecasts. The third thing is that we find that especially um, around competitive positioning, trends, and financial performance, you find a lot of good disclosure activity on those teams. But then in terms of corporate governance especially, you find very little disclosure in the long-term plans. And the fourth thing is that you find tremendous variation across the long-term plans in terms of their quality. And maybe that's not surprising for the people that have been repeatedly in this room and they have seen many long-term plans. There are long-term plans that are really, really good and there are long-term plans that they are less so, okay? And according to the framework, some really good examples because we need to have best practices to understand how we can improve. Some of the really good examples have been uh, in our analysis, uh, Beckton Dickinson, Medtronic, and PG&E. Uh, so as a result, I think it's really worth going back to those plans and understanding what kind of information they provided. So this is uh, a, a, a concise picture of the three uh, best plans according to the content framework and the methodology that we gave um, in terms of BD, Metronic, and PG&E. And these are some statistics, um, and um, I can barely see them from where I stand, so there's no way that you can see them. Um, but basically what they're trying to give you is a sense uh, of what companies are disclosing. So the top five issues with the most forward-looking metrics were around capital efficiency and profitability, around uh, trends in terms of future marketplace and sources of competitive advantage. These are the so-called traditional trends. And then a lot around competitive positioning. Actually, the long-term plans provide a lot of information in terms of uh, the drivers for strategic, strategic health, commercial cost structure and asset health, and sales operating cost and capital productivity. And more than 50% of the companies do not disclose on, on any of those issues that I'm going to mention. Leverage and the leverage strategy of the company, revenue growth, investments in R&D, assessment of financially material ESG issues and how they are relevant to the business, and as I mentioned, corporate governance issues around executive compensation alignment with long-term strategy. Mauricio made a joke about that. He was right about the joke. CEOs don't like to talk about their comp. Uh, and corporate governance. How will composition of the board guide long-term strategic goals? Extremely important topic. Very rarely mentioned in any of the long-term plans. Um, this is, this is one of my favorite graphs. It shows that there is a very strong correlation between ice cream consumption and shark attacks. <laughs> and of course, you can conclude that sharks like ice cream, <laughs> right? Um, and in research, this is a big problem. This is the problem of, can I really say that A causes B? You know, I don't have like people in labs running around and you know, like I can manipulate them and all this kind of stuff. So we're trying not to say that sharks like ice cream, but basically what is happening, you know what's happening, right? Like people on those months go to the beach, they eat ice cream, they get attacked. 
If you don't go to the beach, you don't get attacked, right? So <laughs> it makes sense. Um, so we are trying to avoid this fallacy uh, by doing the stuff that we do a lot in research. We try to isolate effects. We try to make sure that nothing else is causing this. We try to uh, market adjust, to strip out other things that are going on. And even beyond that, we try to see intertemporal patterns over time. And we strip out those effects even before and so forth. So for, for the sake of this very limited presentation, assume that you know, I have stripped out the shark effect and the beach effect, OK? Uh, in the longer report, you can see all the econometrics and all the statistics. Uh, and here is the overall results uh, that we find, again, in this very limited sample. We find that within the event window, and we use multiple event windows, what I'm presenting here is three-day event windows to try and understand. And you might say, there is a contradiction here. We're presenting long-term plans, and you're looking at short-term reactions, what's going on? There is no way that I can tell you anything about long-term reactions right now. Okay. You have to isolate it in a way that you can try and isolate the effect. We can then look at longer term, term effects. But for now, we are concentrating on Brian said in the information content. So about 1.8% abnormal reactions beyond the market, what the market is doing, around the announcement of those long-term plans. If I am even more conservative and I strip out past history of the same firm, any types of abnormal reactions that they had. And I'm super conservative of that. Why? Because within some of those windows, there will be major events for companies. So you will have abnormal reactions. They will have earnings calls and so forth. So I'm, strip out, I, I'm, I'm, I'm throwing out the baby with the bathwater a little bit here. Then you get down to 0.5%, but still abnormal reaction. You find, um, in terms of trading volume, based on the normal trading volume over the previous 60 days, about a 7.6% increase in trading volume within that short event window around the long-term plans. So something is happening. There is information content, and investors are reacting to the information. And when you look at analyst forecast issuance compared to the forecast issuance before the event, we find that actually there is a slight decrease in the number of forecasts within that event window. We don't find actually that there is any abnormal frequency of analysts taking whatever information is in this room and revising their forecast because of that. We think that this is consistent with that segment of the capital market having different information needs and making forecasts for different reasons. Perhaps more exciting for me, it is the fact that we find that higher quality disclosures on specific themes are correlated with higher market reactions. So we find that in the themes of competitive positioning and corporate purpose, the firms that have better disclosure, they have higher abnormal market reactions. And I'm giving you the difference between the bottom five companies and the top five companies in terms of quality of disclosure on those themes. So the difference between the top and the bottom five companies in terms of quality of competitive positioning is an additional market reaction of 1.01% in terms of returns and an additional 23.8% in terms of trading volume. And in terms of corporate purpose, you can find the results here. Again, very early evidence with limited sample, but we feel that as we build the infrastructure, we will be able to say more things, we'll be able to do more research, and as a result, we'll be able to create better long-term plans so we can mobilize capital markets and reorient them for the long term. So where do we go from here? The first piece is around evidence. What I'm showing you here, and there is a longer report that we're going to produce to disseminate to all stakeholders, is providing the first evidence around how market values, uh, how markets react to those long-term plans. Importantly for me, the analysis also gives us a content framework, a content framework that we can do really interesting things then. We can see, for example, over time, whether the quality of the long-term plans increases or not. We can understand how it varies across industries, how it varies across firms of different size, and so forth. And 
very importantly for me, and this is something that we were all committed right from the beginning, is to create a database. We create a database that investors, companies, and researchers could use in the future to understand the quality of the information that is being provided and understand how people respond to the information. And the fourth thing is actually doing more research. Start understanding, once we have the foundation, the baseline of understanding whether there are information, there is information, there are information pieces inside the long-term plans that are useful, start understanding longer-term effects, which are very much more difficult to actually pinpoint because many things are happening over time. But then we can start looking at how investor composition might change within companies as they are reorienting towards the long term. We can start to see whether management style changes. We can start to see how corporate culture is being affected and so forth. And these are planned for the future. I'm not going to show you a lot of the numbers of the appendix because you just had food and you didn't have coffee. Thank you very much. <laughs> Let's, uh, because of that great uh, presentation, let's put five minutes on the clock because we're running behind. Um, well done. I of course, if you would have come back and said there was no economic significance, then we'd be out of time right now. But anyways, <laughs> is, there, is there anyone that uh, has a question here? It's a lot of information. This is a quiet group. Great presentation. It's good to see you again, George. Um, I, I was wondering if you'd done some work on um, um, the market impact of, there's more and more talk about divestment programs around companies that either pollute or have poor scores on E or the S side in particular. And I was just curious if you'd, if you'd done some work around divestment or even possibly shorting companies to, in order to internalize the pollution externality, for example, and uh, other market impact of that type. Are you seeing anything like that? Is there any research being done? Thank you. Uh, th thank, you for, thank you for the question. The, the answer is um, uh, take everything that I say with a grain of salt, uh, because I haven't done this work myself. I have been a consumer of that research uh, myself, having read the research evidence and the literature and so forth. So my reading of the literature is that there is very little evidence of price impacts uh, from uh, investor divestments from spe specific companies um, going back in time. Uh, so people studied, uh, for example, uh, really back in time, South Africa divestment. Uh, more recently, there have been um, some studies around uh, divestment from um, specific industries, uh, such as polluting industries and so forth. My reading of the evidence has been that the cost of capital effect has been really hard to trace, so it seems to be really small uh, as a result, or very volatile, and as a result, it's not statistically significant. Uh, but I will end my response by saying that everything that I just said could change in the future. Uh, and it could change as more investors are becoming interested uh, in this domain. So to the extent that you will find more investors doing that, naturally, this changes the liquidity in the market and it could generate some pricing effects. Uh, the important thing to consider is whether those pricing effects will be permanent or transitory. And I think to the extent that uh, you have um, lots of investors with uh, heterogeneous preferences out there, my sense is that some of those effects will be transitory. Um, so that will be my, my assessment of the literature on that. And George, we'll turn it to the, uh, we'll go to the board with the two thumbs up. How will this great research get into the hands of key decision makers at large companies? What are your next steps? And maybe that could be one for Brian, too. This is a fantastic question, uh, Brian. <laughs> so, I mean, one of the ways that we are thinking about this research is that it kind of expands the motivational set for a CEO thinking about delivering a long-term plan. So as I mentioned, we think that there are sort of long-term signaling and segmenta investor segmentation benefits for doing one of these long-term plans, right? The way you disclose affects who owns your stock. 
if you signal that you are long-term, if you do a long-term plan, if you move away from quarterly earnings guidance, you will have more long-term investors in your investor base. That's what the literature uh, suggests. So we have like, that suite of arguments, which we think is really powerful and very well documented. But we also need to answer the, as some people have called it on, you know, I think several calls I've been on, the what's in it for me argument. You know, I came up, I spoke to you at this relatively new uh, but very interesting uh, initiative on a very timely topic. What happened? In conventional terms, what happened? Um, and we think this framework and this economic analysis is part of answering that question. You know, there are all these long-term reasons why you should do this, um, but also in conventional terms, people will respond to the information you disclosed. That's how it gets to key decision makers like CEOs. And if I may add one point, because this is such an important question. We can be doing all this kind of stuff, but if people don't know about them, then nothing changes, right? Um, and I can be running around, like I'm teaching courses and I'm giving talks and all this kind of stuff, but actually if all of you, they don't disseminate, you don't disseminate the information. You don't have conversations and say, hold on a second. Here is something that we need to consider. I saw this evidence. Let's debate about them, right? Let's, let's share them. I think our, our ability to scale up is OK, but our ability to scale up collectively is huge. So I would, I would say that we're all, in some sense, information agents here. And that's how our society works right now.